Hi, thank you so very much for taking time to join me again. Today I'm excited because I'm starting a brand new series titled Universal Priesthood. And this is based on the core theme or belief that every believer is a priest. So you can also call this priesthood of all believers. That's why I call it universal priesthood. Every believer is a priest. And today being the first episode, I want to lay a foundation by going the way of history, historical background. And I want to talk about how the church has come, where we are today, and what do we need to do to improve. Now, in um, the 16th century, uh, in Europe, there was a German monk and priest by the name Martin Luther. Martin Luther was in the Roman Catholic Church as a priest and a monk, and he was studying and praying, and he got some revelation as to some of the errors that the church was teaching as at that time. So I want to tell you some of the things that the church was teaching. What was it that Martin Luther believed in or the revelation that he got? And where are we today as a church? How do we make the difference? Number one thing that the medieval church in those days taught was the fact that God works exclusively through a select class of priests. The key word being exclusively. So that means that God works through only a select set of people who are called priests. And outside of those, he does not work with any other person. Now, this select group of people called the priests were the ones that administer the sacrament, you know, marriage, communion, um, extreme unction, holy orders, and whatever it is that they were doing in the church in those days. Number two thing that the church taught in the medieval era was the fact that salvation chiefly comes through the sacraments and the priests who administer them. So they believe that if you walk with the priest, they give you the sacrament, as I've mentioned before, uh, you will get salvation. Number three thing that the church taught in those days was the fact that the priests were a unique class of individuals. So they don't belong to the same order of, of, of group of people as the people in the congregation. And they believe that they were of a higher order than ordinary people. And the ordinary people, according to the church then, did not have capacity for deep truths of God. But thank God for Martin Luther, who in 1517 came into the church, uh, he's been studying. So he actually wrote a set of theses, 95 of them, and that is too much outside of the scope of this teaching. But Martin Luther believed that there are errors in some of the things that the church was teaching. For instance, uh, the whole aspect of indulgence. Indulgence is where uh, it essentially means that the church has actually uh, remitted your sin or the sin of somebody who has gone. So if my father had sinned and I was afraid that my father would have gone to hell, I have an opportunity in those days, according to that teaching, to, to change his position by doing some good works by donating to the church and you know by punishing my body you know penitences and all of those and it that actually became a way for the church to raise money so i could donate significantly to the cathedral that was being built in the hope that my sin or the sin of my father will be remitted and i will get a certificate for it Okay, so Martin Luther then came to the scene and he tried to bring some changes. And the core of his teachings, there were 95 theses which he nailed on the door of the church and it was very, very uh, revolutionary in those days. Now, the core of his beliefs were this. Number one, the Bible is the central religious authority. Not any human being, not any church book, not you know a set of materials but the bible in fact they had the word in those days sola scriptura only the scriptures the number two thing that martin luther believed in the central the theme of his teaching was the fact that humans may reach salvation 
only by faith salvation is by faith and he got the, this from romans chapter 1 verse 17 uh the new king james version says for in it the righteousness of god is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith so martin luther believed that all those penitences all those paying money doing good works do not in any way add to salvation or result in salvation rather salvation is basically putting your belief in the lord jesus christ you know he said salvation and eternal life cannot be earned by good deeds but just by putting your faith in the lord jesus christ martin luther also opposed this concept of uh, what is called sacerdotalism dotalism and forget about the big word it it just talks about some people being sacred being the priest and they being the intermediary between god and the people it was that bad in those days and um, i i believe that whether martin luther quoted this scripture or not it was central to his teaching first timothy chapter 2 verse 5 it says there is only one god and one mediator between god and man and that is the man christ jesus so that is founded in the bible there is no need for mediator i don't need to pray to somebody who will not pray to god no once jesus died and the curtain of the temple was was uh, parted i have access to god so martin luther helped in doing that now martin luther was very very useful in bringing forth the new church most of the new generation churches i mean the pentecostal churches were actually called protestant then because he protested against the roman catholic church now the reason why he came was the fact that there was a gulf that was beginning to be created between the the priests and the the laity the clergy actually as they called it people who did the work of god and people who were ordinary observers as it were and the the the, the gulf was becoming wide more and more until it became a chasm now the impact of the gulf is the fact that there was what is called the spiritual world or the spiritual estate and the temporal estate and the church tends to give more um, respect to the spiritual estate in fact individuals today have what they call my spiritual life and my secular life separating it segregating it but martin luther said look there is nothing like that he maintained that there is nothing like a spiritual estate or a, a temporal or physical estate he said there is simply one estate to which all believers who are baptized in the lord jesus christ belong to now fast forward this is year 2023 like i said the modern church benefited a lot from the teachings of martin luther and he, he later on became uh, proven that this is true even though he really suffered a lot of persecution in those days but fast forward to 2023 i personally believe that if we are not careful we are going back to the dark ages the pre-martin luther the pre-reformation days uh, maybe not that glaring, but there are certain things that we need to make changes to. And that is why I'm starting this series of teachings and I will take my time to go through it. The number one thing is that the Bible has to be and remain the final authority in the church. And you may say, oh, nobody is disputing that. But in many churches today, the Bible is relegated to the background. Maybe we teach human philosophies. Maybe we teach some good ideas and then we sprinkle it with the Bible. And how much time do we even have for the Bible? I'll give you one example. Years ago, I went to a church, a local assembly in my city, and I was very hungry for the one. I said, let me go and try. This guy is a teacher of the word. And when I got there, in spite of the travel I'd made, the pastor was not the one around. I was an associate pastor. And as he was teaching, in a teaching of like 30, 40 minutes, he said HBR like five times and i was like what is hbr it took me a while to, before i realized he was talking about harvard business review i'm talking of a sunday morning service now is there anything wrong with harvard business review no i don't have any issues with it but if a pastor quotes harvard business review more than he quotes the bible you agree with me that there is a problem okay so i'm not saying don't make anecdotes those but don't make that the center 
not on a Sunday morning. You can do that on your business uh, seminars, but you know, making Harvard Business Review the call. And by the way, the way at which the rate at which you quoted HBR, HBR, you will think HBR is a version of the Bible. So we need the church today needs to go back to the Bible, making it the source of everything we have and making it the central theme of our belief in God. Now, salvation by faith alone, which Martin Luther also fought for, we are almost beginning to lose it, maybe without knowing. What do I mean? The emphasis on certain material things or certain elements are becoming too much you will think that you know some materials like you know handkerchief the way we put emphasis on materials or put emphasis on a particular building or a particular camp if you come here and pray you will get answer or if you use this holy oil even the way we go to you know the so-called holy ground as the holy land as if you know is heaven no we are almost replacing replacing salvation by faith with all these material things. These things, oil, well, handkerchief, you know, sitting on the particular the man of God's chair. Maybe they have their places. You can prove it in the Bible, but that is not the core, and that does not guarantee salvation. That does not bring salvation. The third thing that I want to bring as I begin to wrap this up is the fact that when you have intermediary between God and man, then you are going back to the dark ages and you are doing harm uh, and injury to what Martin Luther had fought for. The rate at which we emphasize human beings, so-called man of God, you know, is almost becoming like you are making them teen gods. You know, you talk so much and people cannot do anything without the pastor. You can't hear from God except you go through the pastor. You know, there is so much hero worship in the name of authority. And I'm not against authority. I will talk about the place of pastors, you know, prophet, teachers, apostles, and the fivefold ministry. But what I'm saying is that church members need to be upgraded. This series of teachings is not meant to denigrate or to reduce the leaders. But it's meant to call up those who are the followers. So you see, most of what we see today in churches is simply the ministry of one person. Or perhaps at best, a few selected individuals while the majority remain observers. So what am I saying? I'm calling everyone to go back to the Bible, to go back to the fact that salvation is by faith alone, not in any material, not in any paraphernalia, and to make sure that there is no intermediary between God and man, whether you call it the name of a man of God or whatever it is you call it. Now, I started with the story of Martin Luther, and I want to conclude with his quote. So Martin Luther said, and I quote, It is pure human invention that Pope, bishops, priests and monks are to be called the spiritual estate, while princes, lords, artisans, and farmers are the temporal estate. On the contrary, all Christians are truly of the spiritual estate, and there is among them no difference at all but that of the office. office. If I pause there and make a comment, end of quote, you see, I can boldly say that the president of my country is no more a human being than myself. I am a human being, he's a human being, I'm a citizen, he's a, he's a citizen. So what is the difference? Just the office. That is the difference between anybody who is occupying a, uh, a, a, a spiritual post in the church, which you call, you know, pastor, prophet, teachers. and the, So they are not in any way extraordinary or unique or in a special class. It's just that they are fulfilling a particular role and we need to give them the respect. So again, Martin Luther said, there is no true basic difference between laymen and priests, princes and bishops, between religious and secular, except for the state of the office and work, but not for the sake of status. So I stop there and, you know, basically all I'm saying is that you need to know that you are a priest. And there is a lot of responsibility and, of course, privileges that are associated with being a priest. All I want to do in this first episode is to tell you that you are a priest. So when next you look in the mirror, look at yourself and know that you are looking at a priest. In the next episode, I will continue this series of teachings by looking at what does it mean to be a priest? 
what are the responsibilities of a priest and what are the privileges of a priest until then stay blessed